Hello, everyone. Thanks for making it out in the cold. Um, yeah, I'm excited about the part of the story that I get to share with you because I get to share with you what we're doing right here in this community pertaining to climate adaptation in particular. So um, I'm going to describe some of the efforts that we're undertaking as part of the Huron River Watershed Council um, that is very is very strong involvement from Ann Arbor. Um, the project's called Creating Climate Resilient Communities, and we're working on getting climate adaptation going out of the planning phase and into the implementation phase in ways that'll really help our community uh, be resilient to uh, changes in our climate. So the impetus for the project, more and more the partners that we worked with at the Watershed Council were um, expressing interest in incorporating climate change into what they did, into decisions that they made. I know this is a problem. I don't know what to do about it. I hear national statistics. I hear global statistics. None of that really captures what um, is happening here and, you know, the information that I need to make a decision on the ground that will respect um, uh, our our climate future. So we set out to help fill that knowledge gap. And what we did was we brought together climate scientists and we brought together the practitioners um, in the water resource sector. As a watershed council, we're thinking a lot about water. So uh, our work is uh, centered on water resources. So we got these folks in a room together and started to try to chip away at what answering the questions about what do you need? What kind of information do you need? Let's dig into the data, dig into the science, and here's the best that we can share with you now about what we know. You know, uh, how does this help you do your work? So um, it was also very sector driven. Um, we facilitated the process, and did not lead the, um, the development of solutions. Um, respecting the fact that folks in a profession know best about their profession how climate and weather intersects what they do and um, let them figure out the uh, most important things to tackle based on the information that, that we could uh, share with them. So we asked these groups of folks, um, how does climate change affect your business, your business as usual, what you do in your day to day? Um, we started by sharing with them as much local climate information as we could um, and asked them, how does this change uh, what you do? And then what additional information could you use that's actionable, something that you can actually take and run with that would change uh, your practices to make them more adapted to climate change? The focus of my talk today is not going to be the details of any graphic or a real in-depth characterization of how climate's changing here. These are just a couple of graphics to illustrate some of the information that we were showing to, to um, members of our sectors, letting them know that annually average temperatures are increasing, annually we're seeing more rain and snow, um, and it's cut off at the bottom, but uh, you know, some of the prevailing information is we're just seeing a lot more variability and a lot more extremes. Uh, I want to credit uh, Gleesa. I didn't do it on the slide. Gleesa were our climate scientists. That's the Great Lakes um, Integrated Sciences and Assessment. Um, they're a group out of uh, University of Michigan and Michigan State. And if you want to find, if you want to dig into the weeds of the data, look at um, glisa.umich.edu. Okay, so you guys recognize this place? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, okay. Everyone knows this place, right? Um, it's a big place. Um, I want to use the stadium to give you an, an illustration of the magnitude of climate changes we're already seeing, okay? So this is looking back at historic record, not even looking forward. And of course, models tell us a lot of the trends we're seeing in our historic record are just going to keep going, okay? So anyone want to guess, and nobody that was in the room while I was adjusting the slides and might have seen the answer, anyone want to guess at how many Michigan stadiums we fill in rainfall every year? in Ann Arbor? Somebody throw out a number. Hundred and seventeen. 
that's how much water we have to manage on the ground here every year. And this is a lot of water, and this is 23 more stadiums than we experienced here just 30 years ago. So if you think about uh, how we manage water in urban environments, it's through a lot of infrastructure, pipes and detention ponds and all of those things, most of which are in an ideal situation in the ground 50 years, and in more realistic situations are in the ground 100 years, 70 years. We were not planning for this amount of rain when that stuff went into the ground. So we have some real issues that we face with the magnitude of change that we're seeing already. And there's a cascade of implications beyond infrastructure. We have flooding issues, erosion, um, polluted runoff getting to our rivers, wear and tear on our infrastructure. So a cascade of implications from changes like this. So um, when armed with this type of information, our sector teams came up with some really great strategies to start preparing for what we're seeing and what's coming. I'm going to share a few of those stories with you today. Um, we have a group that's uh, focused on in-stream flows and hydrology, or sort of the ebb and flow of our rivers. Um, faced with the information that we were going to see bigger and more frequent storms, they said, whoa, that makes us very vulnerable to um, more detrimental flood events and dam failures. Okay, so these are issues that uh, have implications for uh, economics, for public safety, and for the environment. So their solution, one of the solutions, um, was to develop the Huron River Dams Network. If you see a map of the watershed that Ann Arbor is in, um, those triangles along the river are all dams on the main stem of the river. There's 16 of them, there's eight different management agencies, and historically, these groups don't talk. The individuals that operate a dam upstream don't necessarily talk to their downstream neighbors, or maybe one or two stream dams um, you know, next door, but uh, certainly not coordinated across the watershed. And speaking to Missy's point that these things don't follow government boundaries, water is a perfect illustration of that. You get a flooding upland in Oakland County, you're going to feel it in, in Washtenaw. And so it's very important to network these folks. Um, they have met, um, we've had two, our second annual meeting is coming up next week. Um, there's an email list connecting them. They all have each other's contact information at this point. It's already allowing them to communicate about day-to-day -day operations to do that better. And they'll be connected in... Um, uh, in case of an emergency situation. So um, preparedness here has increased dramatically just by getting these folks talking. Um, another group was our uh, group focused on stormwater. Uh, so we talked about all that rain that falls on Ann Arbor, and Ann Arbor is a lot of pavement, and we have to do stuff, we have to do something with that water when it falls. Uh, so when told that storm intensity, duration, and frequency was increasing. Um, this to them raised a red flag about inadequate stormwater management systems. So how do we uh, accommodate what's coming when we built for a different um, climatic setting? So their solution um, was to adopt revised storm definitions. This gets a little technical, but essentially there are um, definitions of storm events, how much is going to fall and how much time, and probabilities assigned to those. And so um, uh, the current definitions that were being used or that are being used to make stormwater decisions were based on data that hadn't been updated in 30 years. The federal um, government, NOAA, just revised these storm definitions. And what I want to impart on you here is how dramatic the changes are in some cases about the number that was used to make decisions in the past and, and our reality um, currently. So this storm, you guys might recognize this spot on the map. This is U of M's campus. This was last summer. This was a, um, uh, a small event. That's, this is all cut off. Okay. And you're going to have to listen to my numbers and not the... Um, my graphic because it's it, it didn't 
um, show up well in this format. So this is a one and a half inch rain event, okay, that caused this much flooding. Now granted that one and a half inches fell really quickly and that um, often leads to flooding. But our 1% chance storm was historically over four inches, okay? 1% chance storm is, there's 1% chance each year that this, a storm of this magnitude is going to occur. Um, so that's the historic 1%. When the revisions came in, we added more than another inch to that, a 17% increase in rainfall for those really large events. So um, getting municipalities to make decisions based on the new storm de definitions rather than the old ones is really important. Washtenaw County is already doing this. They're taking the lead on it, and uh, I commend them for that. Development in the future from here forward is going to require much more strict um, adherence or much more strict uh, guidelines for infiltrating water on building sites rather than allowing it to run off. So step in the right direction there. And the last one I'll touch on real quick, uh, one of our sector teams was focused on natural areas and urban forests. And this group said, okay, the seasons are shifting, the temperatures are increasing, we're getting more drought. This has a lot of consequences for the composition of species that are gonna do well here. W which ones are gonna do well, which ones aren't, and then let's start thinking about what that means for our, um, the management of natural and urban forests. So the table shows which species are going to do better, which is indicated by the plus sign, kind of neutral, the zeros, and are going to decline in the future um, in the, with the negatives. And just one illustration of what that could mean or the implications of it um, is aesthetic. Uh, what we have here is fall color in the beech maple forest that's most common here now. Our future climate's more conducive to oak and hickory, which is a lovely forest type too. I'm a botanist in training and I love them all, but um, it's browns and muted colors, which is very different than, than what we're used to, and we actually have a pretty substantial economy built on our fall color. So um, these folks have built a toolkit to start educating land managers on some of the changes in species composition in our forests. So that's just a quick view of, of what some of the things that are happening here um, in the Ann Arbor area and the Watershed Council. I did want to say um, to Missy's point about hazard mitigation, we're starting a fourth sector team this year that's in part because of the climate action plan here in Ann Arbor to start working with um, emergency management professionals and folks that work with hazard mitigation to start looking at those plans and see if we can't infuse better climate information into our um, mitigation of natural hazards and our preparedness to respond. That's where you can find more information on the project and where you can find me.